out with me today, everybody. I appreciate uh, everybody's time. Um, and we've got, as, and during the summer to boot, to really think about, you know, what's going on out there in the world of school law as it relates to ed tech uh, and all of the related issues. So we're gonna cover a lot of different ground this afternoon as we think through these legal issues, data privacy, some uh, social media issues, some uh, use of electronic communication and use of our school email system, all of those kinds of issues we're gonna, we're gonna talk through today. But as we do it, please don't be shy. So please feel free to use the Q&A box um, to ask questions as, as we go through to really um, make this a time that's meaningful for you to try and get some of those, those questions answered as we, we think about uh, those issues. And so I've, I've structured this as a top 10 list, although you'll see at the end, I've got a top 10 list within my top 10 list. But nevertheless, we wanna really think about all of those technology related legal issues impacting school districts. And just, you know, first on the list, coming back to that broader data privacy issue is to make sure that we really are doing what we need to do as a district to train and communicate with all of our employees about SOPA and those related data privacy requirements. You know, we've got lots of policy requirements, uh, issues dealing with our web posting and written agreements, you know, and, and a lot of that is dealt with by your, your technology staff, by your administrative staff, by, by others, but there is a role for everybody uh, in terms of making sure that we are implementing those reasonable security measures that we're really using those approved operators uh, and having those agreements in place. So I just, I wanna make sure that that is an area that is front and center on our list to make sure that we are meeting those needs to have conversations with everyone. There shouldn't be a school employee who doesn't have at least a thimbleful of knowledge when it comes to, to SOPA and data privacy issues so that they can understand some of the roles that relate to, to them. And within the reasonable security practices required by the statute and that have been developed by the LTC and ISBE, um, you know, are some training requirements so that we do have uh, a security aware, you know, a cybersecurity awareness program uh, and training on how to handle and manage those things appropriately. So I, I just want to make sure that as we are thinking about, you know, onboarding new employees uh, or as we're refreshing existing employees on these issues, that we understand that that training component that is embedded within what we need to be doing. And most importantly, that we are training them to make sure that they are not using any new online sites or services or apps that are gonna collect student data or other covered information unless we've gone through that SOPA approval process. You know, I think that's the, that's the key piece for us. So I just wanna really encourage everybody to stay on top of that. We've gotta keep that on our top 10 list. We gotta keep it on our to-do list. And so everybody has a role and needs that knowledge. And so as you're planning your, your first day for staff and, and other things for next school year, uh, when you're thinking about what types of orientation you're putting in place for uh, incoming and new employees, let's not overlook uh, this piece to it when it comes to uh, how employees are, are handling that. And of course, you know, the, um, the LTC through the Student Privacy Alliance has some great resources available to help with you with some of those, those basic things. So please, please do that. But I think the bottom line for me is to make sure that every school employee knows that they are only permitted to use approved operators, that they're implementing those regional security practices, including away from school when we're accessing the school's network and devices, you know, as appropriate and following that updated policy. Let's, so let's keep that number one on the list. We want to make sure that we're having that, that good communication with staff about that. Number two, uh, related to that, just one other quick SOPA reminder here that I wanna have in place when it comes to the data privacy is looking what's in your existing policies. And so I presume most of your districts um, use the press policy service. Um, you know, and the statute requires uh, each school to have a policy designating which school employees can enter into those, those agreements. And so I encourage you to look at that because in the press policy, for example, it specifically requires the superintendent or designee to designate which district employees have that approval. 
And then it actually requires the superintendent or designee to list those employees in the policy or the procedure itself. And I still get some districts that send me the policy that hasn't been completed, that isn't filled in, um, that's still just a blank form that was sent to them from press. And that's not useful, that's not helpful when we're getting into these real situations. So make sure that we're, if we're following through on that to get those, oh, that policy in place. And the other thing that I think I see districts overlooking um, is that within those press procedures, there's a role for an ed tech committee um, that plays an important role in terms of um, deciding what online applications or other other ed tech uh, programs we're gonna be using as a school district and developing that process for, for approval for that. So make sure that you recognize those things that are in those administrative procedures that we need to be taking a look at um, and, and the role of the district's privacy officer under those policy requirements. So again, um, I, I hope that those of you who are with us today have spent a lot of time thinking about those issues related to SOPA and data privacy, that that is not um, anything that's new to you. Obviously, if you've got questions um, about some of those data privacy requirements and the statute under state law, we can talk about them. So please ask those questions now and, and we, can, we can dig into that. But I, I, I think that there was an awful lot of work a year ago, right, um, as we were on our trajectory for full implementation of SOPA last July 1. Um, and so a year ago, we were all spending a lot of time really talking about those issues. And rightly so, because I think there was a, there was a lot of heavy lifting at the front end to get you know, those agreements in place, posted on our website and, and, and get that in place. But then all of a sudden, I'm not getting the same number of questions as the year has gone along. And the concern that raises for me is that maybe we've got some schools and districts who saw you know, SOPA compliance as being a one-time project and then it's kind of dropped below in, in priority. And of course, we've got to stay on top of that as we are using or changing to new operators, new uh, applications, uh, new online sites and services that we may have educators who are using in our district, we've got to stay compliant with that regard. And of course, because technology moves so fast, we've got to make sure that we're keeping up to date with some of those basic cybersecurity issues. So please, please, please uh, make sure that we're meeting some of those, those basic requirements that are there for us. So that's why I start with those first two items, my top 10 list, kind of being a callback to a lot of that SOPA piece and those things that need to be part of what is still happening on an ongoing basis perspectively. So let's start there. But moving into the third item here on my list, we recognize that data privacy is not just limited to super requirements that we've got within FERPA, within the School Student Records Act, and lots of other sources of requirements that we keep confidentiality. And so even prior to some of the requirements of, of, of SOPA and COPPA, I always love that one is a long O, one is a short O, but you know, we all make our own choices about how we're gonna pronounce acronyms, right? Um, one of our favorite things to do, especially in the tech world, is to debate how to pronounce various acronyms, right? But we've got those, those basic data privacy requirements that are still there for us, that in, in some ways are slightly different from or may go further than those SOPA requirements so that we're not disclosing things to third parties. And so again, here on the slides, I've, just, I've given you some resources to the FTC's federal guidance, for complying with the federal COPPA. The Department of Ed has made lots of resources available when it comes to data privacy, um, you know, um, considerations, which have been, you know, real significant. You know, as, as we continue to have online platforms, remote learning, distance learning options, continuing to expand for students, we don't want to overlook um, some of those great resources that are out there for us to make sure that as we do so, we're doing so in a way that still meets those, those FERPA and Student Records Act requirements. And so I think that that's really important for us to keep in mind. Now, I've, I've also found, I think some people maybe improperly re relying on FERPA and student privacy related issues to avoid trying to meet some of those remote learning demands. And, 
And I think that what's very clear at this point, when you look at the guidance from the Federal Department of Education, is that it is not a FERPA violation to have, for example, a parent be able to observe a student in an online class. Um, because according to the Department of Ed, that's no more of a FERPA violation than if they were observing a class in person and the parents have that right to observe. Um, and that we wanna make sure is that we are not otherwise inadvertently sharing information in class, whether that's in person or virtually or some other remote means that uh, would otherwise violate FERPA, right? So we don't wanna say you know, to a student, hey, you know, so-and-so, it's time for you to go take your medication or, hey, let's come talk about your failing grade. You know, th th we got to be careful about what we're saying verbally anyway. And some of those same issues uh, arise for us in that regard. There was a recent case, I, I should have cited it here in the materials just because you can't make this stuff up. A decision just issued by SPPO, the Student Privacy Policy Office of the Department of Ed, um, last fall where you had a teacher inadvertently share a student's grades with 113 other students and parents. Uh, and what happened there is they accidentally sent a group message uh, as opposed to an individual message related to the student's grades and, and things going on in, in class. And, and obviously that was found to be a violation of FERPA. So, you know, when we talk about some of those requirements for, for training under SOPA, they bleed over into some of these other privacy and confidentiality areas like, like FERPA uh, in that regard. And so when we start talking about handling sensitive information and who has access to records, you know, those things are really important for us. And I think one of the other related FERPA issues that I have seen popping up in several related complaints, um, both uh, at the state level with some comp ISB complaints, as well as at the federal level, when you look at SPPO and some of their decisions over the last few years, um, is when other school employees may have access to student data or student information uh, and for students for whom that, that employee does not have a current demonstrable educational or administrative interest. And so making sure that, for example, in your IEP software or your student information system, that we aren't making the permissions for access so broad that other school employees have access to information that they don't need in order to do their job uh, and not in furtherance of the student's interest. So I, I do think it's important that while certainly the SOPA compliance piece and the data privacy and cybersecurity piece is so key, and that's why they're first and second on my top 10 list today, we've also got some data and electronic records privacy issues that pop up under FERPA or the Student Records Act that are equally important for us to keep in mind and we wanna make sure that we're thinking about. So uh, really think about that. And one of the things that I think is a fundamental first step in that regard is figuring out, you know, within your student information system, who has access to what, right? Um, if I'm a teacher in your district, um, what students um, information do I have access to and have we limited that appropriately or is it too broad? And so I, I really want to make sure that that is an area that we are carefully considering um, and figuring out within that student information system how to limit that access so we are not inadvertently violating for part of the Student Records Act. And I think that's that's really key. Here, here's a quick story. Uh, you know, we always love stories. Where how, do, how do one of these cases exist? One that I had is a situation where um, dad wanted a copy of his child's IEP. Who does he ask? He asks his girlfriend. Why does he ask his girlfriend? Because she works at the school. She's not his child's teacher. She doesn't have any relationship in terms of as an educator or as a school employee with this student, but she had access to be able to get that electronically. And so when mom finds out that dad's girlfriend got the IEP for him, of course, she's upset. And she's the one that files the complaint to say that the girlfriend's ability to access that child's IEP violated FERPA and the Student Records Act, and she was not wrong, right? And so the district had to make sure that it was taking steps in terms of who's within that FERPA circle of trust, if you will, uh, in terms of access to those electronic records. So I think that goes beyond just cybersecurity and SOPA issues and really digs into who has access um, in terms of how we've set those internal controls uh, as a school district. Um, and then one more on, on the data privacy is just continuing to make sure that we're prepared for those ransomware attacks. We continue to see 
a lot of districts handling that. You, you guys who are participating today, you know what ransomware is. I don't need to read you the definitions of that. You, you, you know what's out there for us. You've seen what's happening you know, over the last couple of years on a, on a broad scale in terms of just the number of incidents relating to schools and, and how expensive those can be. And so we really want to make sure that we are taking um, good steps, making good decisions to help train staff how to deal with that, right? Um, you know, this case from a couple of years ago where, you know, a ransomware attack hit a school district, but because they had the right things in place, they were able to just miss a few days of school, get things back online and move forward. So we want to make sure that we all are paying close attention to those ransomware issues. We're trying really hard to train staff how to avoid those phishing schemes and those really, really sophisticated social engineering techniques. You know, when we start to, you know, and that when it starts to look like it's from somebody you know and, and starts to make it more and more realistic so that, you know, we are, we're, our, our guard is let down a little bit. Um, it, it looks more legitimate than it is. We want to be very cautious about that. And so trying to make sure that we are um, really avoiding clicking on links, opening files that we don't trust or we don't have good information about. And so those are those are really important, really key pieces for us. I want to make sure that that is actively part of our, our plan so that we have a good incident response plan. I know the National School Board Association um, has, has typically recommended looking at that National Institute of Standards and Technologies um, Incident Handling Guide. That's a pretty detailed process. Um, but again, these can be major, major things that we want to look at, make sure we've got insurance coverage for, know how to stop, know how to handle our backups, you know, all of that's really important stuff for us. So we want to make sure that we're meeting those, those obligations for sure. So it's kind of the, the, the beginning here, right? We, we've spent our first 20 minutes uh, really thinking through those issues related to data privacy. And again, if you guys have questions, don't, don't be shy about popping those up in the chat or the Q&A. But I think there's some other legal issues that are out there that relate to ed tech and uh, electronic communication and, and social media and, and other factors. And one of those I think is a, a good recognition when it comes to students' uh, Fourth Amendment privacy rights. Um, and so I, I think that we are we're starting to recognize that as school districts, we are collecting an awful lot of data about students and that we've got students who are using some combination of their own devices, school devices, you know, we've got personal devices on school networks, we've got school devices on personal networks, and every combination iteration thereof. And that certainly raises different considerations when it comes to students' um, constitutional rights, both on the First Amendment, as we'll talk about in a little bit with free speech issues, but also under the Fourth Amendment when it comes back to, to, to that piece. And so, um, you know, there continue to be a number of cases where school districts feel the need for whatever reason to get into and search the contents of a student's phone. And, and we want to, um, you know, pause here a little bit and really think about, okay, what are the students' rights in this regard? When is it appropriate for us to conduct the search, if ever, right? And some of the legal considerations that come from that. Uh, and under the Fourth Amendment, right, while law enforcement generally needs probable cause to be able to execute a search on a citizen, for a school official, that standard is a little less. It's reasonable suspicion. So was the search justified in, at its inception? Was there a reasonable suspicion of a violation of school rules or the law that justified the search to begin with? And then was the scope of that search reasonable? And so we think about that generally, right, in terms of like a book bag, right? If we suspect that a student may have, for example, uh, drugs or other contraband in their backpack, you know, do we have reasonable suspicion in order to be able to justify a search of that backpack? And then was our search reasonable in scope? Did we go too far? Did we dig too deep beyond what it was that we were looking for or what our reasonable suspicion justified? And generally speaking, courts have applied that same standard when we're talking about searching the contents of a student's personal device, right? I think that this is where we start to recognize that difference between the extent to which a student has an expectation of privacy in a school-owned device or on the school's network, um, where that is very limited and limited by our policy, by our acceptable use policy, 
versus when they're using their own their own device, right? So, you know, going back a long time ago, at least when it comes to ed tech case law, right? 2006 was a long time ago because 2006 is probably when we're talking about a student texting. So they were like, A, A, B, C, right? We're, 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 we're trying to use our number pad to text back in those days. Remember, remember how much fun that was to, to be able to do that? And some kids are really good. They can do without looking, you know, be able to use their, you know, Nokia flip phone and, and text pretty, uh, pretty well um, with great dexterity um, and accuracy. Um, but in this case, we're talking about one of those earlier devices where the school officials, you know, without reasonable suspicion, searched through a student's cell phone, searching through the directory, the text messages, listening to the voicemails, using it to communicate to see if other students were violating the cell phone policy of the school district. And ultimately here, the court found that that violated this student's Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable search and seizure, that right to privacy, that it was a fishing expedition um, just to look to see if the student was violating the rules. Now they try to justify it by saying that they believe that this student may have been uh, engaging in uh, a drug deal at school, but there still wasn't a reasonable suspicion that there would have been uh, a violation of school rules as it related to the phone and it violated the fourth amendment to, to search the phone. Um, you know, similar outcome here with the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals case from 2013. Um, here they said the fact that the student had some general history of discipline without a more specific basis for why now, why today, why this student, why this student's phone didn't justify reasonable suspicion to be able to search. And so again, here just finding another appellate court finding that school officials search. Um, violated the, the Fourth Amendment uh, in that case. Um, some other interesting twists on that Fourth Amendment right to privacy conversation uh, and how courts have looked at it or how students have argued it. We've got this case from Nevada, which is kind of, I, again, it's almost 10 years old now, but it is an interesting case uh, and one that I think continues to make the point well. This student tried to argue um, in a case that was in part a First Amendment violation, right, in terms of the, you know, being disciplined for what he posted on Twitter. Um, but in this case, he argued that because his Twitter account was set to private, um, that it violated his Fourth Amendment rights to privacy because someone shared his, you know, took screenshots of his private Twitter account and shared it with the school. But the court just had no interest in that. He said, basically, you know, you put it on the internet, right? When you, even if you set your, your settings to private, you, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy in what you're putting on social media. That's not an inherently private form of communication. And whenever you share information with a third party, you take the risk that that person is going to share it with the government, right? And so it wasn't like the government was going after his Twitter account. It was someone else sharing it with, the, and in this case, the government is the school district, right? It wasn't like the school district itself um, tried to access his private Twitter account by, you know, accessing his password or some other things. It was that a follower, a friend of his who had access to his Twitter account by his own permission, right? He gets to approve who his followers are, shared that with the school district. So I do think that is, is relevant for us to think about in terms of recognizing the limits of where that privacy goes. Um, and just know that the Illinois school code specifically prohibits us from requiring a student or parent to provide a password or similar information to access a student's social networking um, profile or, or anything like that, right? We can't demand access to a student's private messages. Um, now, if they voluntarily give it to us, great, right? But in terms of uh, our ability to um, require them to give us their password or other related account information, um, you know, we, we're prohibited from, from making that inquiry under, this, under the school code. But I ask the question, you know, even if we do have reasonable suspicion, should we be seeking a search of students' device? Because we are in a place right now where the prevalence of things like child pornography and sexting among students is just so prevalent that I'm, I'm genuinely concerned about that, right? Um, and so there are absolutely times when we do have reasonable suspicion and it would be legally acceptable for us to search the contents of a student's device. I don't know that I want to. Um, we've got several recent cases where, um, you know, 
administrators found nude photos of students um, on the phone. And we, we, we see just the data tells us that that is so universal and ubiquitous. You know, there was a article, I think, in the Atlantic a couple of years ago that looked at a small high school in rural Virginia. I think it was a high school of about 500 students. And if I recall exactly how that played out, it followed the, um, the sexting and cyber crimes sheriff's deputy who was um, investigating an issue of sexting and child pornography of students sharing pictures of each other. And it started where uh, an underage girl shared pictures, new pictures of herself with her boyfriend. Of course, he then shared it with his friends who shared it with his friends. And in this high school of almost five, about 500 kids, if I recall the story correctly, accurately, they found out there were everybody ultimately had a, had those that girl's pictures except for four students, all but four had them on their phones. And so, you know, we just, we recognize there's, there's a lot there for us and we just want to be very cautious about how we handle that. Um, so I, I just, um, I, I share that piece because even when we have the right to do so, is it the right thing to do? Although, you know, we had a recent central district of Illinois federal decision where a principal was found to have reasonable suspicion. This case was specifically related to an alleged threat. A student had posted a gun meme that had caused some disruption at school. Um, and they searched uh, the, a student's phone to find out if that student is the one who had posted the meme. Um, and they found that the scope was, that there was reasonable suspicion to search the phone for evidence uh, based upon the other statements other students had made. And that was reasonable in scope. They didn't go beyond um, once they found what they were looking for. So again, we've, we've got a case here that goes in the school's favor um, here in central Illinois. But again, I just, I'm, I'm nervous about what might be on a student's camera roll. So keep that in mind. Uh, a couple other points here as we, we roll through our conversation. Hey, number six, make sure that we're meeting those accessibility requirements for students with disabilities. Um, continues to be uh, a lot of litigation out there related to web accessibility. Uh, and we know within the state of Illinois, we had the school code amended effective for last school year to make sure that um, our websites and any online third-party curriculum that we're using um, meets the AA level of, of web accessibility guidelines, right? Or whatever the, the current um, requirement is that it kind of automatically changes as the consortium's requirements change, but we wanna make sure that we're meeting those requirements. So one of the concerns that stands out to me, of course, that's long been a federal requirement from OCR. And so I just note that here from a recent OCR decision. But something that is oftentimes uh, a concern for me in this area is that we have third party vendors who say, we promise that our program is accessible and then it doesn't actually meet those requirements, right? So just we wanna make sure that, um, that we are meeting those, those required elements um, there's there are ways to run that check uh, and again OCR will give a lot of technical assistance to school districts to help them get there so if that's an area you're struggling with you can certainly get uh, OCR to to help you out in that regard um, and try and get some technical assistance um, it's been one of the top complaints filed against school districts um, I think in part uh, as I understand OCR's data is there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of complaints filed against school districts around the country uh, for their websites not meeting the accessibility requirements by the same person, right? If there was one person in Michigan who was basically going to school districts websites all around the country, and if they didn't feel that they met the web accessibility requirements, then they had filed an OCR complaint against them. Um, so just keep those, those factors in mind when we're looking at how that's going to play out for us and that we're meeting those requirements. And I know a lot of us uh, participating today might have some responsibility for helping oversee our school district's website and what we post on the website. Um, and I, I will tell you, as I look at a lot of school district websites on a nearly daily basis, because I'm going to it for copies of the collective bargaining agreement or for copies of policies or, or other information uh, I'm looking at, uh, I'm not sure that they all meet those requirements, right? So um, if that is within your zone, 
right? And making sure the school district's website meets all of the accessibility requirements with the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504, um, then we wanna make sure that we're, we're meeting that. And that's an important requirement for us. So, so keep that in mind, bear that in mind, and let's not overlook those requirements. But let me come back to the question in the Q&A. Most schools use some form of, a, of a LMS and the website is most of the basic information. I would guess OCR extends to the, that and not to the LMS, not just the website. Yeah, anything we're posting, all of that has to be accessible and meet those accessibility requirements. So yes, um, the answer to that is your, your assumption is correct. Um, that, is, that is there for us to, to, to recognize. So let's spend a few minutes on the social media front. If you hung out with me in December, um, we talked a little bit about the Supreme Court's decision last June, just almost right out a year ago, uh, in BL versus Mahano Area School District, in which the Supreme Court really looked at student social media use and when and how a school district could discipline a student for, for that. Um, and, 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 you know, so this was June 23rd, so just, just, just right at about a week short of being a, a year ago, where a student, uh, after she didn't make the varsity cheerleading squad, posted a Snapchat, a caption of saying F cheer, and a picture of her giving the middle finger, among some other things. And she was, uh, in response to that, suspended from the JV team for a year. She sued, and of course, the Supreme Court found out that that violated her First Amendment rights. Um, but what I think is interesting about the Supreme Court's decision in BL versus Mahanoy, and again, we, we talked about that more detail in December, so if you want to go back to watch December's uh, webinar, if it's still on, on YouTube, Matt, I don't know, um, you can look at that in a lot more detail. But, but really, the reasoning was what was fascinating to me. I'm not surprised that she won, right? Um, you know, of course, this violated her First Amendment rights to free speech. The issue, of course, is how the court got there in terms of recognizing that there are limited buckets uh, of, of situations where a school can regulate or discipline student speech. They, they articulate, right? Cyber bullying, threats of violence, cybersecurity issues, or not following the, the rules with, with remote lessons. And so what I want to focus on here is we've had since that decision, a number of other court decisions over the last year that have dealt with this issue and some, some of the falling out from that and what that really means for us. So we've got the, the Ambridge area case from August uh, last year, where a student in a, these are all Snapchat cases, post in a group of football players and coaches, a number of statements that you can see here that, uh, including a picture of himself with a gun, that was interpreted to be some combination of both a threat of violence, but also a form of harassment. And so the court found these were not protected by the First Amendment because this wasn't just simply using bad language. This actually crossed the line from using bad language to threatening violence and harassment of other individuals. I just wonder why the student felt the need to post that in a group that included the coaches as well, right? But that is important for us to, to keep in, in, in mind. Um, you know, the, the next case here, a case also out of Pennsylvania, this one from November, uh, kind of, you know, the, the facts here are interesting. The student who is being disciplined and is suing here, JS, sends a, a meme making fun of another student to only one other person. Uh, and in that student, he's saying basically, I think student two could be a school shooter. And because he likes the band Cannibal Corpse and references the lyrics to that song, he's expelled. Um, Ultimately here, what the court says is that the, while the actual words employed in the memes read in isolation plainly suggested a school shooting and violence, they said, but viewed in toto, it didn't threaten anybody, right? Only offered the student's opinion that student two was a potential school shooter because he liked the band Cannibal Corpse. And what the court said ultimately here is that while it was mean-spirited, sophomoric, and artful, misguided, and crude, it was not intended to be a threat. And what I think is really interesting here is because the school said, yeah, but it was disruptive, right? Because others might have viewed it to be a threat. Isn't that disruptive? And what I think is really interesting here, and we're going to talk about this with online threats in a few minutes with our, our next item, is they said here, basically, nobody saw this except one other student. And the school eventually learned of it, right? But it wasn't itself creating a disruption. It was the school district 
that created the disruption that they cited to. When the school said, look at all these examples of how the school was disrupted, the court said, yeah, and that's all because of you, school district, because of the email you sent out to parents that was poorly drafted and, and, and created the, the disruption for everybody. And so ultimately, I think what's interesting here is they said, yeah, maybe if you needed a, a short-term suspension to figure it out, but then to move forward with expulsion, once you've done a proper threat assessment, once you decided this wasn't a real threat, you know, any disruption was created here by the school, which I think is just really an interesting piece. We're going to talk about that threat stuff in a little bit. I see the question. I'm going to come to that here right after I talk about a couple more of these cases. So I'll, I'll come back to that, that question there in, in the Q&A. So, so hang on a second. So just a couple other of these social media cases. We've got a First Circuit Court of Appeals decision um, finding that uh, cyberbullying um, was not protected by the First Amendment because that was one of the categories that the Supreme Court held in Mahanoy was eligible for discipline. Uh, they found here that these hockey players uh, in Maine who had um, uh, cyberbullied with each other, that, that was not protected by the First Amendment. Interesting thing here in a Missouri case, uh, a student posts um, a video of herself drinking alcohol to Snapchat, which only she ends up hospitalized with alcohol poisoning, things are bad here. And she's suspended from extracurriculars for the alcohol violation. She tries to claim, well, because I posted myself drinking alcohol to Snapchat, that somehow converted it into being protected speech under the First Amendment. The court said here, no, you weren't disciplined for your Snapchat post, you were disciplined for the alcohol violation, and that's not protected by, by the First Amendment. Um, I, I, I point out this Katie Texas case because of, as you note here in the very last sentence on the slide, the court ultimately dismissed this claim based on qualified immunity, but with an interesting note here to the school saying, because these issues arose prior to the Supreme Court decision, right? I mean, this happened a couple of years ago. We get the court decision in November of 2021, but the actual issue happened, you know, a couple of years ago. And the court here said, basically, it wasn't so clearly established what the law of the First Amendment was until the Supreme Court issued its decision in Mahanoy. And so basically what this court is saying is, school administrators, we're not going to find you liable and the school district liable for what happened prior to the Mahanoy decision. But you're on notice now. And if you had done the same thing now, this is probably a First Amendment violation, but we're going to find qualified immunity in place right now. So that's an important note to us pay attention to what's going on out there. Um, a couple other cases that I think is interesting here on that First Amendment and cyberbullying front, this Plano, Texas case from February, happy Valentine's Day to this case. Um, at a sleepover, a student is um, bullied by other students, made him drink from a cup that another boy had urinated in, you know, awful thing. Uh, a third student videos that post the video to social media. Um, this student tried to say, and then the student who actually did it was disciplined by the school for violating their cyberbullying policy. But the court really didn't like that argument and said, no, the fact that something was caught on camera didn't make it cyberbullying because the student who was disciplined wasn't the one who recorded it or the one who posted it. You know, you know, the fact that they were caught on video outside of school doing something didn't turn it into cyberbullying under the school's policy unless they are the ones who videoed it or posted it, which I do think is an interesting component, again, to how we look at those, those social media cases. Uh, just a couple other ones here decided this, this spring. Um, another case out of Missouri where a student while on the school bus on the way to an away football game. So I think here we're, we're definitely within the school's context. Posts um, has what the court calls playful banter about slavery um, and starts an online petition titled Start Slavery Again. Um, and ultimately here the court found that this was disruptive. This is a form of cyber harassment and that it was not protected by the First Amendment that the school could constitutionally regulate and issue discipline um, in part here because, you know, it was during a school sponsored activity. So I just think some of the key themes from these cases, I think the severity of the punishment is an unspoken factor. Um, you know, there have been at least nine cases in the K-12 context since Mahanoy. Um, 
In those cases, other than Mahanoy, where the punishment was limited to extracurricular activities, the school prevails. But when cases involving expulsion tend to go against the school, so I just think that there is an underlying uh, issue here with the severity of the punishment being important. Um, you know, I think that we see that vulgarity is okay, right? That there's, there's when it's on social media, it's not okay at school, but it's okay everywhere else. Um, but I think, again, so much of this is arising in that extracurricular context that we've got to have some training for coaches and, and sponsors on, on how to make sure they're handling those situations appropriately, that we can't have our extracurricular codes of conduct get too far out uh, to the point to which they violate the First Amendment and are regulating um, protected speech under the First Amendment. Um, and we're going to see a little bit more here on this um, threat assessment piece. So we want to we want to talk about that as well. All right, let's talk about. And again, if you guys have more questions, feel free. The, the chat's there, and as we and the and the Q and A is there, and as we get closer to the end, if there are other topics you want me to to answer, I'm I'm happy to do that as well. Uh, number eight here again, just back to making sure that we're using those threat assessment procedures appropriately uh, when we get an online threat. I want to, you know, we know. Uh, under the Illinois School Safety Drill Act, we've got to have that threat assessment team so that when someone articulates, a student articulates a threat, we've got to convene that team. There's an important role here, um, and especially when we're thinking about, you know, uh, school safety issues being on the forefront of our minds, you know, um, they updated the, um, the previous guidance from the Threat Assessment Center. Um, in 2018, after the Parkland, Florida shooting, it was updated. They had updated guidance last year. I, I assume we're going to see even more of that after the Uvalde shooting uh, to continue to see those recommendations out there from the Secret Service and the National Threat Assessment Center. But I want to make sure that we're also using our own policies and procedures appropriately. Um, so when it comes to the role of the threat assessment team, that we are not overlooking those procedures, again, that we have adopted ourselves. Um, and so just a couple of cases that really, I think, play this out for us. Um, you know, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals decided this case in, in March. Um, and what's interesting here in, in this case, this case arose the day after the Parkland, Florida shooting. So this student at Starbucks, was having a, a peer discussion uh, about the Parkland Florida shooting that a teacher overhears. And it concerns the teacher and ultimately they turn him into the police and the student is removed from classes uh, and ultimately suspended out of school, um, but the board upheld his suspension. The court here found that there was no threat and therefore this, this speech violated the student's uh, First Amendment rights. So we're not really talking about uh, you know, out of school social media speech here, but I think we're back to that, you know, what is a threat, what is not a threat piece. And so here they said, you know, this student engaged in a factual discussion with peers about a current event, uh, which happened to be a school shooting, um, and that the first amendment does not allow schools to restrict students from engaging in factual, non-threatening speech, um, which is what's going on in, in this case. So that case is going to continue to play out. We've got another Pennsylvania case uh, from this year. A student posts a Snapchat what is ultimately lyrics from the song Snap by a band called Spike. Any Spike fans? I don't, me either. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll love them if I ever heard them. I don't know. But this, uh, this student, you can see, um, uh, posts some, you know, some of these lyrics. Um, student is then arrested, charged, held in juvie, subjected to a psychological exam, and expelled from school. Um, you know, after the superintendent notifies the community about the threat, you've got significant absences, a quarter of the student population are absent. Um, and ultimately, the court found that the actions here violate the First Amendment. And the court said, although the students post sparked a chain of events that undoubtedly led to the disruption, um, we conclude that his post was constitutionally protected speech. Um, in part because they said basically this is another situation where it was the school's response that created the disruption, not the post itself. And what I think is interesting here is the court noted that a brief suspension while the school investigated would be reasonable and wouldn't necessarily violate a student's First Amendment rights um, or perhaps even due process rights, you know, assuming we're, we're meeting those, those requirements for a, a short-term suspension. 
But the fact the student was then ultimately expelled, right, after the investigation and presumably the threat assessment happened, but that's where it went too far. So I do think it is really important for us in these situations. And what the court said here is public schools may certainly take appropriate good faith steps to protect their communities in fluid situations where it is unclear whether there's a harmful intent and that there is nothing in the first amendment that will require them to sit on their proverbial hands, right? But here, once they got the information they got, they said they didn't clear the extremely high bar um, set by the first amendment and, and that, that going further with expulsion, once they had completed their threat assessment, um, violates the, the First Amendment in, in that case. So again, I just, I think it's really important for us to, to bear in mind that careful tightrope balance, as the Ninth Circuit once put it on these First Amendment issues, but make sure we're carefully following those threat assessment procedures. All right, a couple more items here on my top 10 list. And my last one is a, its own top 10 list. So let's get, let's get to it. Um, number nine, you know, for our district operated social media, we've still got some other First Amendment issues, right? So again, when you're creating a social media account for official school purposes, use it for school purposes, not personal purposes. Use your personal account for personal posts, your school account for school posts, and we're not going to mix the two. And recognize that when we do use an account for official school purposes, it, it, it may be then considered to be um, you know, under the First Amendment, a limited public forum. And so that was true. The Second Circuit held back on a case uh, involving former President Trump back when he had a Twitter account, that because he also used that account for official government purposes, in addition to being his personal account, it's a public forum and he couldn't block people based on their viewpoints. And of course, you know, what was, what was out there is important for us to, to keep in mind. So recognize that while we can put time, place and manner regulations, um, we have to be content neutral. And we also just have some uh, attorney general opinions here in Illinois, including a non-binding opinion from 2020 relating to blocking people from a school district, or in this case, a, a village's social media accounts. So we just want to keep in mind the, the limits the First Amendment places on us. So we've got to really think about how we regulate, if we can regulate, um, and making sure that we're not violating the First Amendment and how we operate that social media account. Right. Remember, we can't delete comments just because we don't like them or they're critical. You know, we're going to, I think, go back to those Mahanoi factors, right? Do they, are they harassment targeting an individual? Are they uh, threats of violence? Are they a cybersecurity uh, violation? Um, are they lewd, vulgar, obscene? Because when it's on the school's social media account, like the school's Facebook page, we can limit lewd, vulgar, and obscene, just not outside of school, right? I think that's important for us. So we want to make sure that we're effectively using district operated social media. And then finally, number 10, making sure that we are and training our staff to use our school's networks, email and other systems in a professional manner, right? And so I just wanna end with another top 10 list here on how we are using our, our school email because the bottom line is I encounter an awful lot of emails and other forms of electronic communication among school staff, and it is shocking what people are putting in writing, right? And so I love this meme, right? Dance like no one is watching, email like it may one day be read aloud in a deposition. So let's really think about when we're using our school's network, our school's electronic communication, our apps, our devices, whatever it is, Let's handle it in a way that's professional and appropriate. So here's my last top 10 list to get us through our last several minutes today. First of all, remember the email is not an inherently private form of communication. And so I think that this is a different level of privacy, right? Even though we have to have all of our cybersecurity and data privacy issues, right? We spent the first half of our, our conversation this afternoon really thinking about issues of privacy. Remember under FOIA, or the Student Records Act, we may have to turn those emails over to people, right? Uh, and so we wanna make sure that we are not thinking about that and, and recognizing the limits to it. So maybe we shouldn't put in writing things that we don't want to put in writing. Two, you know, I've often said in terms of that professionalism, if you wouldn't put it on school district letterhead and sign your name in ink, but I don't know that I would put it in a school email or use your school email, right? We wanna be professional and have that professional persona 
because remember, sarcasm doesn't always translate, um, you know, nonverbally. Um, and we want to really think about what that means. And so that professionalism is, is really important for us to make sure that we are not, um, you know, getting too far afield from our role as an educator and using the school district's system. Link emails go unread, right? That's just a reality for it. And so we want to make sure that this is an effective form of communication. And one of the most important things, and I've learned this, it's so important for me too, is have an informative and specific subject line. No subject or update, you know, that, that's not enough, right? We want to make sure that subject line is really there. That's really important for us. And of course, because humans are by nature narcissistic, narcissistic people, when we start our email with the word you, it usually gets people's attention. Right? It's a great way to reinforce those in-person conversations, right? So um, you know, how many times have we seen, the, of course, the, the meme or the joke online, like here's a, a meeting that could have been an email. Well, that requires people to actually read the email. So I, I have a love or hate relationship with that particular uh, meme that I see sometimes, but I do think it is important to recognize that the role um, our email electronic communication plays in the school setting to make sure we're reinforcing those face-to-face -face discussions. But recognize it is not a forum for criticism, right? It's there to be used for the school's purpose. So we want to make sure that we are, we are keeping our emails positive, solution-oriented, focus on the school's educational mission. This is not our diary. This is not our place to vent, right? We've got to make sure that we are, we are recognizing the appropriate way to do that. And if you're that person who's using email the wrong way, recognize that and recognize that it may not be protected by the First Amendment. I also think we need to recognize with, if we send a thousand emails a day, people will also stop reading them. So it's not just long emails, it's also the number of emails. So, you know, we don't want to be the, the person who cries wolf and, and there is an important email and things are getting lost because I've sent so many emails uh, or my emails are too long, right? So we want to make sure that we are using it for its intended purpose, uh, consistent with our tuple use policy. I think that's really there. It is really important sometimes, especially if you're not going to be able to get back to someone immediately to acknowledge it. And, and, and this is something that in my life I, I, I have a careful balance with, right? Because especially as a school attorney, I know when someone emails me, they're waiting on an answer, right? They've got a problem that they need my answer to, but I'm not always in a situ situation where I can respond to an email immediately, right? I'm not in a situation where I can, I maybe I'm talking to you fine folks, right? And so I, I don't have the moment right now where I can get back to whatever email happens to be in my, my inbox um, or I'm in a meeting all day. And so I know there are people out there who are waiting for responses. And so sometimes, especially if we know it's something that's going to take us a while to be able to respond to because we need to gather information or talk with somebody else, just acknowledging its receipt can go a long way, especially with a parent, right? They've asked a teacher a question and they want an answer to say, hey, I got that email. Thank you. I'm going to get back to you here tomorrow or the next day with an answer to that. That helps lower everybody's temperature, everybody's stress level, keeps everybody on a calm, cool, collected front. Uh, goes a long way, is professional, is meaningful. Be courteous, right? We don't want to be rude, right? Um, and so just think about that, whether it's, you know, saying an email to avoid talking out loud to the person who's sitting 10 feet away from you, um, whether it's putting things in writing that you shouldn't put in writing, um, you know, all of that is important. And so we want to make sure that we are engaging with that professional courtesy and what we're putting in line. Now, admit it, we've all done it, right? We've hit reply all when we shouldn't have. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes I think the, the new form of reply all is to, you know, unmute yourself in a Zoom meeting uh, unintentionally, but, but nevertheless, think about that. One of the things I've done, I don't know if this is magic or anything, for anything that's a lengthy email, anything that's more than a sentence or two of an email, I don't draft it in my email program, right? Um, I actually just open up a, a Word document. I type my email there. It gives me a chance to think on it, spell check it, grammar check it a little differently, and then copy and paste it and make sure I'm sending it to the right person. It just, it slows me down a little bit, not necessarily for those of you worried about being billed by the hour, right? Um, 
but it does help me make sure that I'm avoiding things like sending the right thing to the right person. I think that's really helpful um, to be able to, to do that. So we want to make sure that we are thinking about that from a privacy perspective. You know, that could be a FERPA violation if we talked about earlier. So really avoid that reply all that's unintended. And then number 10, keep those personal emails personal, right? We don't want to use our work email for personal purposes. We shouldn't have our Amazon account associated with our school email. We shouldn't be using it for personal correspondence. We could be sending it, shouldn't be using it to send memes to our friends at nine o'clock at night, right? That's not what our school email is for. <clears throat> and so we wanna make sure that we're using our school accounts and devices for school purposes, our personal accounts and devices for personal purposes, you know, and, and how that, that plays out together, I think is an important role of, of responsibility and professionalism that we wanna we want to keep in mind. So the bottom line for me, we got to make sure from the big picture perspective that employees, students, and parents know our policies, know our acceptable use policy, that we're educating employees on data privacy, on those protection of, of confidentiality issues. We can use technology intentionally to create real connections uh, with employees, students, and the community, and be good examples. Be good examples of how to use email, how to use social media, how to use approved apps, how to keep data privacy in place. Let's be good models of that, train that out for everybody. So I think that's the plan for us, okay.